the talented Mr. Ripley. A twisted thrill ride about one man's attempt to steal another man's identity. Tom Ripley says, you know, when I'm myself, I'm a nobody. But when I'm somebody else, everybody loves me. After a man lies about being part of one of America's most famous legacies. He said being a Rockefeller was a lot of fun. You know, try it one day. Police think they have a real life talented Mr. Ripley on their hands. Rockefeller is the ultimate icon of American traditional wealth. It's like a guy who plays guitar you know, being in a bar and someone saying, are you in a band and saying, oh yeah, I'm in this little band called The Beatles. When this phony icon is linked to a murder, it appears detectives have a copycat killer in their midst. It's actually spooky how close the two crimes are. But this house of lies doesn't have a Hollywood ending. For Clark Rockefeller, the whole thing came unraveled when he kidnapped his daughter. In the end, I don't think he even knew who he was anymore. There was a lot of fear about what Clark Rockefeller would do. Nineteen ninety-nine, the talented Mr. Ripley captivates audiences from coast to coast with its remarkable plot and unforgettable characters. The talented Mr. Ripley is a dark and deadly psychological thriller about a man who will kill to keep his identity safe. The film stars Matt Damon as Tom Ripley, a man who covets a lifestyle beyond his grasp. Who can forget Matt Damon's iconic line, I always thought it'd be better to be a fake somebody than a real nobody. When Tom meets socialite Dickie Greenleaf, played by Jude Law, he sees the chance to leave his ordinary life behind. He becomes obsessed with him, then kills him, then becomes him. You have to wonder what kind of person can completely become someone else. Off the screen, it appears that a Bostonian aristocrat by the name of Clark Rockefeller of the iconic Rockefeller family is doing just the same. You'd have the name Rockefeller, the famous industrialist, this storied um, American family with wealth and fame. Any person who hears the name Rockefeller thinks of, you know, great estates and beautiful cars and um, power. Rockefeller evokes this idea of uh, business titans and wealth and privilege and generations of, of wealth. Clark Rockefeller has never had a problem using his name to get what he wants. And now, he only wants one thing. Clark Rockefeller had a plan, and the plan was to kidnap his daughter. Clark has recently divorced his wife, Sandra, and lost his daughter, Ray, in the custody arrangement. Clark told his friends that the custody arrangement was unacceptable. He was apparently devastated by this arrangement. He was very hurt. He, he adored his daughter. And he'll stop at nothing to get her back. Now Rockefeller just has to get his daughter alone. But there's a problem. He isn't allowed to see Ray unsupervised. But that isn't going to stop him from getting what he wants. He contacted his livery driver, a man who had been driving him around for a while, and asked him if he wanted to make a few quick bucks. There's this guy. I, he's been really bothering me and my daughter, and he's become an absolute pest. I need to drive out of town for a little while. You would do anything for a Rockefeller. This is Boston, where there's so many historic names and so much wealth and privilege and prestige. A, a Rockefeller even trumps all of that. On July 27, 2008, Clark executes a plan to take his daughter and disappear for good. I know, right? <laughs> you having fun? Yes. <laughs> Go take a look at the fish. Okay. Go on. Careful, Ray. Come on, Ray. We really gotta go. 
So the livery driver goes at the appointed time, sees Clark approaching with his daughter and this man who's apparently this big pest in Clark Rockefeller's life. At least the sun came out, right? Yep. Quick, come on. In fact, he pushed him to the ground, threw his daughter into the car, and jumped in, so let's go. Unbeknownst to Rockefeller's driver, he's now an unwitting accomplice in an elaborate kidnapping scheme. And the so-called pest is actually a court-appointed social worker. Well, the livery driver, oh, Ray hurt her head, so why don't we just go catch this cab and, and I'll take her to the hospital and I'll meet you in a couple of hours. The driver agrees to Clark's request, not realizing he will never see Clark again. Luckily, police already have an Amber Alert out for Ray. Ray Starrow Boss, seven years old. In an effort to get Ray back home safely, police ask Sandra to make a public plea for her safe return. They wanted to see if they could find a way to get him to just turn Ray in, turn himself in. So they had Sandra Boss um, do a video where she really humbled herself. Clark, all the things have changed. You will always be Ray's father, and I will always be Ray's mother. She stares into the camera and begs her ex-husband to please bring Ray home. We both love her dearly and have only her best interests and well-being at heart. I ask you now, please, please bring Ray back. There has to be a better way for us to solve our differences in this way. Sadly, Clark and his daughter remain on the lam. Hardly anyone can believe what Rockefeller has done. Anytime the name Rockefeller comes up and it's involved with the crime, people become very interested. We all were fascinated. Oh my gosh, Rockefeller has committed a crime, the crime of kidnapping. I'm sure. Jake, you gotta give me something. Okay, thank you, man. Nothing. Yeah, I'm fine. Something's all right. The next day at the police station, detectives question Sandra about her husband's past. Sandra doesn't deny that Clark's family name is what initially attracted her to him. What happened when she met Clark was that, you know, he was a brilliant man with a very seductive name. And she was seduced by that name like anybody else who met him. How long did you know your husband before you got married? We got married in 1995. Miss Wells, we have to talk. We are struggling to find any information on your husband. Credit As card. time went on in their marriage, she began to see that Clark had some serious issues. Sandra Boss paid for everything. She paid for meals, she paid for clothing, she paid for their housing, um, and Clark Rockefeller had no problem spending her money. And yet at the same time, he could be very stingy with the money. And then she drops a bombshell. I don't know who he is. I just know that he's not Clark Rockefeller. And one of the first things that Sandy Boss said to them is, I have no idea who he is. Sandra Boss was terrified of him. She had no idea who he was, what he had done, what he was capable of. Days later, police get some more alarming news about their fugitive. Nothing on this guy from the passport office. We got no driver's license. A spokesman for the prestigious family completely denies having a Clark in their bloodline. What do you have? The family doesn't even know him. The family doesn't know him. The family doesn't even know him. This guy's a ghost. He doesn't exist. One of the things that everyone's trying to figure out is it's very clear very quickly that he's not Clark Rockefeller of the Rockefellers. So who is he? No one can seem to figure out who Clark Rockefeller truly is. OK, thank you. What you got? There's nothing. No nothing. family, no friends, no one knows. Luckily, detectives get a timely clue from a wine glass that may just lead police to his true identity. 
The night before this abduction, Clark Rockefeller has a glass of wine with a friend of his. They dust the glass for fingerprints. They send it to the national lab. It turns out, just like Tom Ripley in the movie, Clark Rockefeller has a bloody link to an unsolved crime from the past. That print came back to an application for um, a license for a stock brokerage firm. And it was signed by a man, Christopher Crow. Christopher Crow. And Christopher Crow, it turned out, was one of the aliases of a man by the name of Christian Carl Gerhard Schreider. But that isn't the only alias police find. Christopher Crow was also the alias of a man by the name of Christopher Chichester. And Christopher Chichester is the man who was wanted in connection with the slayings of two people in San Marino, California in 1985. This just turned into a murder case. Could it be that police are searching for both a killer and a kidnapper? Clark Rockefeller manufactured a life of cinematic moments. But did Rockefeller follow Ripley's lead and go as far as to kill to cover his tracks? Detectives haven't seen the end of Clark Rockefeller's credit list. If you look at the number of incarnations he had, there, there, were, uh, there were probably a dozen different personas that he had uh, over the years, and these were all invented by him. When the talented Mr. Ripley debuts in theaters in 1999, it instantly becomes one of the most talked about films of the year. Critics all over said this was, this was an excellent film, a great, a great movie. Its star-studded cast leaves audiences speechless and wanting more. But it's Matt Damon's portrayal of the mysterious Tom Ripley that steals the show. We don't really know all that much about Tom Ripley's backstory. Uh, he's clearly a man who wants something more of his life. Off the screen, a real life Mr. Ripley is coming to fruition after Clark Rockefeller kidnaps his daughter. Clark Rockefeller, he was able to convince everybody that he was uh, a Rockefeller. They didn't question his name. He was very convincing. You look at Tom Ripley, he doesn't just get a taste of the first class lifestyle, he becomes addicted to it. It's similar to how Rockefeller gets a taste for the wealthy life by using the Rockefeller name. After a fingerprint match points to Clark being a killer in addition to kidnapper, police also learn Clark's true identity. His real name was Christian Gerhardsreiter, a teenage German student who'd come to America in search of an education. He turned 18 years old and told his family, I don't want to be here anymore. I want to move to the United States, and I want to become rich, and I want to become famous. And he took off. He enters a student exchange program to make good on his promise. Once in America, Christian finds refuge with a host family named Hi. the Savios. Come meet Christian. Hi, I'm Allie. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Savio family is this middle-class family in Connecticut that took Christian in. Um, he was looking for a place to stay. At first, the German teen is happy in his new surroundings. He simply wants to be privy to the American dream. But after several months, his overzealous ways start to transform him into a Tom Ripley of sorts. <laughs> okay, guys, that's enough. Come on, we've got to go. Brian, put your tie on. He's completely not interested in them being his family. <laughs> He's only interested in learning some things about American culture. Um, and he spends a lot of time watching Gilligan's Island, <laughs> where Thurston Howell III is this wealthy millionaire with a Boston patrician sort of accent. And Chris begins to incorporate some of Thurston Howell's mannerisms into his persona. So Christian, you're not going? Is that a no? And along with his new accent, Christian's attitude changes as well. He would demand things, you know, do this for me or bring that to me. He very quickly wore out his welcome. He refused to eat their Italian nice food. Nice come down and spend some time with us. Yours is there, I'll be glad to heat it up, but it's cold. No. I can't eat that stuff, it's disgusting. It's peasant food. Are you kidding? He called them peasants. He insulted the, the, the mother, the matron of the family. We welcome you into our home like family? And you don't like the food? Are you for real? Just get out, I've had it with you. You've worn out your welcome and I want you out of this house now. It makes no difference to Christian 
He's already on to his next move to achieve the notoriety he craves. With the Savios in Christian's past, he decides to make his next transformation and enrolls in a college at the University of Milwaukee. While there, Christian looks to obtain the next thing that will help him evolve, a degree in film. He talked about being a film buff, and I think he just, I think he, in, in many ways, you have to wonder if he sort of took on the personas of the people he was watching on screen. As an academic, Christian excels among his peers. He learns how to dress, how to act, and how to speak with style and sophistication. And it quickly attracts the attention of a female classmate. But for Christian, this relationship isn't about romance. He was dating this woman, and he wanted to get married solely for that. And I think that he was very clear there that he, what he wanted was a green card. He wanted a path to citizenship. Look, we don't have to be dating. We don't even have to live together. It's only so I can get a green card. Are you sure this will work? Trust me. I know it will. It was very quickly done. It was very clinical. They got married, and um, just as quickly as he came into their lives, he was out. Now that Christian has what he needs, he's on to his next design, like a spider weaving a web. It becomes the pattern of his life. You move into a place, you get what you want, and you move on. Just like Tom Ripley, Clark is a master manipulator. It won't be long before Christian reinvents himself once more. And next, he'll resurface as a new man in San Marino, California. When Christian moves to California, he becomes Christopher Chichester. San Marino is a beautiful town. It's very wealthy. People there are very friendly. One of the things that Chris picked up somewhere along the line was that if you belong to a church or if you were a member of a church in a community, it would put you in touch with the people who were in the community and you could pretty much figure out who's who. Oh, hi. Thank you very much. He becomes really good at charming the older women, the older rich widows of San Marino, California. He knows just how to butter them up. Oh, I'd love to meet him. <laughs> Thank you. Christopher is a pro at whining and dining San Marino's wealthiest women. Chris, nice to meet you. That's a lovely necklace. I think he did it because he could. As somebody with a narcissistic personality disorder, um, he, I think, had a very grandiose idea of who he was. Uh, nice to meet you. Along with his new persona, the con man creates a new profession. He would talk about how he was um, a producer on the Alfred Hitchcock Chronicles. So people really believed that he had some sort of connection to the film industry. One of the things that he did was incorporate props. Like for example, he would carry a script under one arm. The manipulation is strikingly similar to a scene in The Talented Mr. Ripley. Tom Ripley happens to be borrowing a Princeton jacket. And the father of the character played by Jude Law notices that jacket and says, oh, are you a Princeton man? And he has a second's pause and he says, yes. When Christopher masters his latest script, he finds his next target in well-to-do 60-year-old Dee Dee Sohas. Dee Dee, Christopher, nice, nice to meet you. Didi Sohas was a troubled woman. She had a drinking problem. She had a lot of health issues. She had been a debutante. She had been married a few times. You could say that she was somebody who was easy to take advantage of. And when Christopher says he needs a temporary place to stay, Dee Dee obliges, allowing him to stay in her carriage house rent free. She needed somebody to live there after her mother died. Chris, wanting to be a part of the San Marino society, took to the living in the back house like a fish takes to water. The arrangement is everything Christopher could hope for. For months, he and Dee Dee treat each other like they are long lost friends. It was at first, like a match made in heaven. Oh, you know, I meant to tell you, John and Linda are coming for dinner that night. Until Dee Dee's son John and his wife Linda need to move back home because of money issues. Hi. 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 Nice to see you again. Hi. Hello, Linda. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Uh, I have someone for you to meet. Oh. I didn't know you had guests yeah. over. Oh. Here he is. 
Hi. And almost immediately, John and Linda smell a rat. I work as a film producer. Oh, wow, film. That's interesting. <laughs> One of the things that we know about John Sohas was that he did not like Christopher Chichester. He was suspicious of him, and he had a sneaking suspicion that he was trying to get his mother's property. You want to talk now? Look, Mom, the situation with Christopher in a guest house. John encourages his mother to ditch her house guest, but Dee Dee refuses to kick Christopher out of her home, and Linda and John become outraged. Linda told her friends that she needed to have a change. There needed to be something that would change. And the best change that she could see was getting into that back house. We looked him up, we saw some of his credits that he says he's in, and he's not real. He's not real, Mom. He's a liar. Why would you call him a liar? Mom, this is not the same person in the credits that's in the guest house. I don't appreciate the way you're talking about it. But when Christopher learns that John and Linda are catching on to his dirty secret, he hatches a plan that is straight from the pages of the script. It's so weird that these two stories have those kinds of parallels in them. It, it's spooky, really, when you consider it. Although the talented Mr. Ripley doesn't win any of the five Academy Awards it is nominated for, its story about a man who assumes identities is the type of movie that is hard to forget. Tom Ripley is, is just a, an incredibly intelligent, conniving, deceitful guy who you can't tell is fooling you until you're already fooled. It's no mystery why Clark Rockefeller, who is now going by the name Christopher Chichester, follows suit in real life. He and Mr. Ripley are cut from the same cloth, and now Christopher has another con in the mix, Dee Dee Sohas. Dee Dee's own son definitely suspected that Christopher Chichester was taking advantage of her. She essentially allowed him to live rent-free in, in, in the back of her house. John doesn't buy Chris's act. There's no Christopher in the, these credits. We've watched them multiple times. I'm sure there is an explanation. Before John and Linda moved back home with Dee Dee, Chris had Dee Dee wrapped around his finger. But now he senses an impasse brewing in the home that may expose him for what he truly is, a con man. Chris wasn't really happy with this, you know, with John and Linda moving into the house. That, you know, it intruded on his con in San Marino. And he wasn't really pleased with this sudden influx of extra people in his turf. It appears that the walls are caving in on Chris in San Marino. You have to be in a way fearless, and he was. I think the only thing he was fearful of was being nobody. John. The fear of his true identity being exposed mimics Tom Ripley's fright, shot for shot. You feel as if Tom's whole con is a huge balancing act. And if he makes one wrong move, that whole house of cards is gonna fall down. And like the talented Mr. Ripley, Chris plans to protect his true identity at all costs. Several days later, Dee Dee confronts Christopher about something that has been bothering her. Her son John and his wife Linda haven't been seen or heard from in days. That's weird, huh? Listen, I'm sure there's nothing to worry about. I'm sure they're fine. I guess. It's just weird. Suddenly, she believes perhaps something else may have happened to her son. Troubling Dee Dee even more is that after she speaks to Chris, he suddenly packs his bags and leaves San Marino. When Dee Dee talks to police about this series of strange events, they can find no records to indicate a man by the name Chris Chichester ever existed. He was pretty good at slipping away if you look at his history. And when he got what he needed or it looked like he was gonna get in trouble, he would just disappear and reappear someplace else. With no way of tracking Chris down and no suspicion of foul play in the guest house, the case gets thrown on the back burner. That is, until 1994, when Dee Dee's home has a new owner. A few years after John Suss and his wife disappeared, a man had moved into that house 
was building a swimming pool in the backyard, and in doing so, dug up the body of John Sowers. Based off the wounds to the skull, it appears someone killed John with a blunt object. And now police are starting to think that the man who was living in Dee Dee's guest house is to blame. One of the things that they do in 1994 is they go into the back house, they rip up the carpet, and they look for telltale signs of blood. And sure enough, they find that you know there had been three sizable pools of blood on the floor in this back house at one time. Testing shows that the blood belongs to John. Shockingly, police never locate Linda's body or find traces of her blood, but they assume that she was murdered and buried in another location. Now there's just one question remaining. Whatever happened to Christopher after that fateful night? Chris leaves San Marino, heads straight east to New York. He takes on the persona of his new identity, Christopher Crowe. While in the Big Apple, Christopher Crowe ditches his Hollywood persona and takes on Wall Street. Chris gets a job uh, as a stockbroker uh, in a pretty big uh, firm, securities firm, actually, uh, in New York City. And um, there, he gets some knowledge that he can use to advance in his career. His chameleon-like ways are reminiscent of Tom Ripley. In the movie, Tom gets away with these multiple murders and, and seems to be free. And for Rockefeller, it'd be hard to imagine he wouldn't feel the same way. I mean, he, he kills, and he's suddenly living this wonderful lifestyle. It seems there is no stopping this devil in disguise. New York is a huge city, and it's easy for somebody to get lost. And a guy like Clark doesn't want to stand out. He doesn't, he doesn't want people to know who he is, really. He just wants to be somebody else. I think you have to be shameless and fearless to pull off what he did. And the deception just keeps snowballing for the man of many names. One of the things that always struck me was just how brazen the lies were. He just told them with so much ease. And in order to do that, you really, you just can't care about the consequences. In The Talented Mr. Ripley, the main character kills to keep his true identity hidden. And it seems Clark Rockefeller has done the same. Christopher Crowe is the same thing as Tom Ripley. Whenever he's, he's close to getting caught, he changes his name, he changes his location, and he moves on. After moving to New York, Christopher changes his occupation from filmmaker to stockbroker. In the movie, Tom Ripley succeeds at hiding his true identity and slipping on a new one whenever it's advantageous. Stan, hi, it's me. Yeah, I need the latest numbers on the NASDAQ, also the USD MYR. Clark Rockefeller was able to pull off a similar feat. Intelligent, educated members of high society New York were fooled by his adopted persona. And with the new vocation comes a title change. He asked for dinner reservations. Yes, hi, Natalie. Um, I would like to make a reservation at Broussard's for this Friday. He can't get dinner reservations in this really oh. fancy restaurant. I see. Somewhere, he gets a brilliant idea, and he comes up with what would become his boldest identity yet. You know, I am so sorry. I should have given you the name of the party. It would be for Clark Rockefeller. He calls down to the restaurant, asks for a seat, and tells them that he's Clark Rockefeller. So you do have an opening. He's instantly given a seat in the restaurant by the window. Not at all, totally understandable. Just like that, Clark Rockefeller is born. He's established himself as Clark Rockefeller, even has a credit card with the name on it. And he moves among this crowd as though he is a Rockefeller. In the talented Mr. Ripley, Tom Ripley gets a taste of that wealth by using the Greenleaf name. It's similar to how Rockefeller gets a taste for the wealthy life by using the Rockefeller name. Mr. Rockefeller? The company Clark Rockefeller keeps are some of the richest and most honorable names in New York City. It's fair to say that the Rockefeller name opens doors and that it's the hallmark of American industry and wealth and power. By the way, this weekend, my husband and I are having cocktails, and my friend Sandra will be there. But one person in particular catches his attention. Sandra Boss. Boss, right. 
Yeah, I think I am free. I'd love to make it. Great, she'd love to meet you. Clark is immediately drawn to Sandra. She went to Harvard Business School. Um, she became a very young executive at McKinsey. She's a brilliant young woman, but also, by her own telling of it, somewhat awkward, somewhat emotionally immature. So do you see anything you like? I think I'm gonna let you order for us. <laughs> you sure you trust me with that? Yeah, 100%. In essence, Sandy is the perfect target for Clark Rockefeller. Clark has an air of mystery about him that intrigues Sandy. And the two become close, very close. They become lovers. So any chance we can pick this up again sometime? Sandra is completely enthralled by her new debonair boyfriend. She has no idea that the man courting her is both a con man and a killer. He told her that he was involved in helping poor countries pay off their debt that he was very much in demand for his um, extremely um, um, rare financial gifts. And she was really taken by all this. Well, I actually recently just got back from the Sudan. People were saying, you know, here's this uh, bright, attractive, accomplished woman. You know, how could she be so stupid to get duped by this kind of con guy. Tell me more. And I don't think it implies any deficits in Sandra Boss that she was charmed by somebody who was really good at doing that. Sandra and Clark's storybook romance blossoms into a marriage. He definitely married well. He married a smart, um, very successful woman who made nearly $2 million a year, and he didn't have to do a lick of work. The newlyweds relocate to Boston because of Sandra's work, and things appear to be seamless, even though Clark has some skeletons in his closet. But soon, Sandy starts noticing some red flags in their marriage. I know things are difficult right now, but we're getting by because I'm the only one that works. She realized she was married to a man who was controlling um, pretty manipulative, um, and in the end, not very nice to her. When Sandra questions Clark's frugal methods, he offers an explanation. Look, listen, all my money is tied up with the inheritance right now. My hands are tied, I can't do anything about it. He told her that, well, you know, he couldn't yet get to the estate because it was wrapped up in a legal battle that prevented him from being able to cash in on the true wealth that he was owed. We'll get through this. Sandra has no choice but to believe her husband. She was raised Episcopalian, and in her words, this tradition, her religion mandated that she work on a marriage, that she just keep trying her best. So she stuck it out even though she was profoundly unhappy. After five rocky years of marriage, Sandra and Clark have a sudden turn of events in their lives. They conceive a child. Shockingly, the birth of Clark's child changes him drastically. He didn't seem very interested in having a child, and he was, in fact, not present for her birth. He was, I think, close to 20 hours late to her birth. But when she was born, he became so involved that, in a way, Sandra was almost shut out. Since Sandra is a high-end executive, Clark becomes Mr. Mom. And it's the first time this cold-blooded killer Let's his guard down. Look what I drew. I see. It's really interesting to think about the relationship that he had with his daughter in terms of was this a con man whose heart finally melted at the sight of his little girl? It's awful late for you to still be up. Or was this a pure narcissist who saw in his child an opportunity to make himself even greater? He got so caught up with painting. Right, Ray? Yeah. <laughs> so you two didn't leave the house again today? I'm sorry, we were on the way there, but we just got sidetracked. Their close father-daughter relationship has Sandra concerned. He thought he was a good dad. I think his wife and other people would say otherwise. It's really late for her to still be up. Yeah, I know, but we were just having so much fun, I figured, what's the harm? She felt that the child was not um, interacting with other children her age. Clark didn't want her going to, to school with other kids her age. She was really worried that, that Ray was, was isolated in a way. Confounding Sandra even more is the fact that Clark doesn't seem to be who he says he is. She hires a private detective to delve into his background. And 
one of the first things that he tells her is that, you know, I can't background him any further past 1994. And then tomorrow we might go to the park. Yippee! How's that sound? <laughs> when Sandra confronts Clark about his shady past, he refuses to admit his duplicitous ways. We need to talk. I don't think he even knew who he was anymore. What is your name? Is your name Clark? Exhausted by her husband's half-truths, Sandra files for divorce. I want a divorce? and I'm getting full custody of Ray. As a last ditch effort to figure out Clark's identity, Sandra offers him a deal. She said that she would grant him custody of the child if he would tell her who he really was. But Clark refuses and tells Sandra that he will fight for custody over Ray. When the two go to court, Sandra has the upper hand. And she told the judge, this man can't tell you who he is. He, he, he does not have a name. And, and the judge impressed upon uh, Clark Rockefeller to tell him, you have to, you have to tell us who you are. And Clark Rockefeller wouldn't. Despite his best efforts to fool everyone, Clark Rockefeller loses his battle for custody. The divorce and the subsequent loss of his daughter's presence in his life devastated him. And he told people, you know, that he would do what it took to get back with his daughter. Even if that means taking her by force. He knows that Sandra Boss is going to do everything possible to get her back. The talented Mr. Ripley highlights a con man with delusions of grandeur. It's a farce that is typically only seen in the movies. That is, until Clark Rockefeller takes the stage. So who's worse, Clark Rockefeller or Tom Ripley? Well, we see Ripley because we've got the benefit of a movie camera going into his private moments, showing definite remorse. Clark Rockefeller, on the other hand, this guy never expressed any remorse. Right now, the only thing on Clark's mind is getting his daughter back. During one of his scheduled supervised visits, Clark abducts Ray and heads south. So in the end, I mean, Tom is tortured, but he's not caught. Rockefeller, the end is not so glamorous. I mean, he abducts his daughter and he, everything comes out. Clark's plan all along has been to get to Baltimore. You love it? Yes. Got this big old bed. Pretty comfy, right? Yeah. Following the divorce of Clark and Sandy, Sandy paid Clark in cash $800,000. The money went to do a few things that would set up this elaborate kidnapping. First was buying a home for cash in Baltimore as Chip Smith. Second was getting a catamaran that he could fix up and sail across the world. This is so pretty. Thanks, Dad. Oh, you're welcome, Ray. Now, as Chip Smith, Rockefeller assumes his sixth known identity since arriving to America. And he has no plans of looking back once he sets sail with Ray. I forgot to tell you about this earlier, but I have a picture I want to show you. What do you think? Cool. Isn't it neat looking? Yes. And you can sleep on it. You can basically travel around the world with it when you're old enough. I promise I'll teach you. Thank you! <laughs> the interesting thing about Ray and Clark's relationship with her is that if you look at his life, it's the first time anybody loved him for just being him. And I think it changed him. And I think that ultimately that that relationship, you know, ended up in us all finding out who he really was. It's only a matter of time before Clark's dark past gets him caught. Since law enforcement all along the East Coast is searching for him, Baltimore might be his final stop. He made quite an impression on many of the real estate agents that he had contact with in the city. And so when the photo of him began appearing in national media outlets all over the country, they of course saw his picture and they knew that this was the man that they immediately contacted authorities to say, oh my God, the man you're looking for is here in Baltimore. FBI agents calculate a plan to get Clark away from his daughter. There was a lot of fear about what Clark Rockefeller would do when confronted by the police. There's a lot of tension, there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of feeling of, I want my revenge and I want the person who's taken my child away from me to suffer. 
So they hatch a strategy to lure Clark away from Ray at a marina where he is storing his boat. He's coming. So they devised a plan. And the plan would be to have the dock manager come up, or at least call, and say, hey, you know, your boat's taken on water. Well, Clark would want to check that out. Chip Smith, sea captain, would certainly want to check that out. Clark takes the bait, hook, line, and sinker. As he makes his way towards the ship, the FBI closes in. The FBI, like, made him by saying, hey, Clark, where are you going? Hey, Clark, where are you going? I still have to buy a turkey sandwich. And he said, I'm going to get a turkey sandwich, as if somehow that, oh, OK, everything's cool, right? But it, you know, he just he gave himself away. You're under arrest. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Do you understand your rights? It's a crazy end to a crazy story. At the very end, you find out that Clark is Chip. Chip is Clark. Clark is Christopher Crow. Christopher Crow is Christopher Chichester. Christopher Chichester is Christian Carl Gerhardt's writer, the 17-year-old student who came to America with a dream of transforming from an immigrant into the all-American store. While in police custody, Clark first stands trial for the charges of kidnapping his daughter. His two defense attorneys immediately went to work on the only defense they knew they had, which was an insanity defense. The jury doesn't buy it, and he is found guilty of kidnapping. He is sentenced to five years in prison. It's a light sentence, but Clark still has one more trial ahead of him, the murder of John Sohus. In terms of physical evidence was not a whole lot. They had a body. They had John Sowas's body. But it had been discovered in the mid-90s when somebody was digging for a pool. So there had been a lot of damage done to the bones. Always the liar, Clark maintains his innocent act throughout the trial. The strategy of the defense was to blame Linda Sohus. And the reason they did that was because Linda Sohus is missing. She has no way to defend herself. It's very similar to the talented Mr. Ripley, where, you know, Ripley blames Dickie's death on Freddie, and he's killed Freddie, too. So you think about Chris killing John and possibly killing Linda, but blaming Linda for John's death, it just follows the script. But the jury isn't buying Clark's story. He is found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to 27 years in prison. The irony is, is that he spent his whole life trying to get away from a small town and be somebody else, and he ends up having to spend the rest of his life in a small town being exactly who he is, a convicted murderer. During his incarceration, Clark never admits to killing John Sohus. I interviewed him in prison, and he just kept talking about how he had all these memory gaps. He couldn't remember anything that had happened in the mid-'80s. And he also told another reporter, I'm pretty certain that I've never killed anyone. One thing that's for sure, no one will ever forget the numerous crimes of the talented Mr. Rockefeller. You could kind of look at him as being the world's greatest actor, and maybe world's greatest actor, director, producer, and star in his own film. Because not only is he creating a persona and acting into it, but he's creating a world filled with props and other characters who support the idea that he is who he says he is. Clearly, these two characters, Tom Ripley and Clark Rockefeller, they've got a lot in common. They're both willing to pull off the con and eager to pull off the con, and they're both willing to kill anybody who gets in their way.